Reading in the Dark by Seamus Dean Read by Stephen Ray February 1945 On the stairs there was a clear, plain silence. It was a short staircase, 14 steps in all, covered in lino from the original pattern had been polished away to the point where it had the look of a faint memory. Eleven steps took you to the turn of the stairs, where the cathedral and the sky always hung in the window frame. Three steps took you onto the landing, about six feet long. Don't move, my mother said. Don't cross that window. I was on the tenth, he was on the landing. I could have touched her. There's something there between us. A shadow. Don't move. I had no intention. I was enthralled, but I could see no shadow. There's somebody there, somebody unhappy. Go back down the stairs, son. I retreated one step. How'll you get down? I'll stay a while and it'll go away. How do you know? Feel it gone. What if it doesn't go? It always does. I'll not be long. I stood there looking up at her. I loved her then. Small and anxious, but without real fear. I'm sure I'll walk up there to you in two skips. No, no, God knows it's of me feeling it. I don't want you to as well. I ain't feeling it. It's a bit like the smell of damp clothes, isn't it? She laughed. No, nothing like that. Don't yourself into believing it. Just go downstairs. I went excited. We were haunted. Ghost even in the middle of the afternoon. She came down a bit, looking white. Did you see anything? No, nothing, nothing at all. It's just your old mother with her nerves. All imagination, there's nothing. I was up at the window before she could say anything more. But there was nothing there. I stared into the mud darkness. My mother was crying quietly at the fight. I went in and sat on the floor beside her and stare redness locked behind the bars of the range. There was a fierce winter that year. The snow covered the air shelters. At night, from the stair window, the field was a white part of loneliness and a starlit wind made the glass shake like loose black water and the ice snore on the sill while we slept and the shadow watched. The boiler burst that winter and the water pierced the fire behind. It expired in a plume of smoke and angrings. It was desolate. No water, no heat, hardly any money, Christmas coming. My father called in my uncles, my mother's brothers, to help him fix it. We came, Dan, Tom, John. Tom was the first one. He was a building contractor and employed the others. He had a gold tooth and curly hair and wore a suit. Dan was skinny and tooth, his face folded around his mouth. John had a smoker's worse medical laugh. As they worked, they talked, story upon story, and I knelt on a chair at the table, rocking it back and forth, listening. They had stories of gamblers, drinks, hard men, con men, champion bricklayers, boxing matches, footballers, policemen, priests, hauntings, exorcisms, political killings. There were great events they returned over and over, like the night of the big shootout at the distillery between the IRA and the police, when Uncle Eddie disappeared. That was on April 22. Eddie was my father's brother. He had been seen years later in Chicago, said one. In Melbourne, said another. No, said Dan. He had died in the shoot, falling into the exploding vats of whiskey when the roof collapsed. Certainly he had never returned, although my father would not speak of it at all. The uncles always dwelt on this story for a while as if waiting to respond or intervene to say something decisive. He never did. December 1948. Brother Regan was lighting a candle in his dark classroom at the foot of the Sea of the Blessed Virgin. Regan permitted no overhead lights when he gave his Christmas address in primary school. Boys, he said, some of you here, one or two of you perhaps, know the man I'm going to talk about today. You may not know you know him, but that doesn't matter. More than 25 years ago, during the Troubles in Derry, this was arrested and charged with the murder of a policeman. The policeman was walking home one night over Craig Avon Bridge. As the policeman near the middle of the bridge, two men crossed over to his side. As they passed, the policeman said, Good night, 
and the policeman returned the greeting. And then, suddenly, he found himself grabbed from behind and lifted a feet. This is for Neil McLaughlin, said one. May you rot in the hell going to your murdering... Regan shook his head and say a swear word. Then he went on. His body was washed up three days later. No one says assailants. A week later, a man was arrested and charged with the murder. He was brought to trial, but the only evidence the police has that he was the friend and workmate of Neil McLaughlin, who had been murdered by a month before. The story was that before McLaughlin died on where he had been shot, he had whispered the name of his killer to this man he arrested. And this man had been heard to revenge to get the policeman, let's call him Billy Mahan, in revenge for his friend's death. There was no point of the law, of course. Justice would never be done. Everyone knew that, especially in those early years. The police thought they could beat an admission out of him, but he did not inch from his story. That night, he was not even in the city. He had been sent by his newspaper to Letterkenny 20 miles away, and he had several witnesses to prove it. The case was thrown out. People were surprised, even though they believed the man to be innocent. Innocence was no guarantee for a Catholic then. Nor is it now. Well, I was in the city in those days, but one of the priests with whom I have since become friend and a young curate, he told me the story of the accused man. This man, prominent in local sporting circles, and he helped in various ways to raise money for the building fund. One night in the sacristy of Tower Church, just down the road from here, he told the priest that he had not been to confession in 20 years. The priest told him to trust God's infinite mercy. He offered to hear the man's confession. He wanted to tell someone, not as a confession, but in confidence. So he told the priest about being arrested. He told him about things he had been given, rubber truncheons, punches, kicks, threats to put him over the bridge. He told how he had resisted these assaults and never wavered. The priest told him that such steadiness in sticking to his was a testimony to the strength a person gets from knowing he's in the right. He looked at the priest in amazement. And then he said these words, words the priest never forgot. Do you think that's what I wanted to be? The story of my innocence? For God's sake, Father, can't you see? I wasn't innocent. I was guilty. Killed man, and I'd kill him again if he came through the door this minute. I, I can't confess. I have no sorrow, no love not to do it again, no pity. Man shot my friend dead in the street for nothing. He was a drunken policeman gone, looking for a Catholic to kill, and he left that man's wife with two young children, and he would have got off scot-free for the rest of his days, probably got promoted for sterling. And Neil told me as he lay there with the blood draining from that man did it. Billy Mahan, Billy Mahan the police man, that's what he said. And even then I had to run back into the door with his body there in the street because they started shooting down the street from the city walls. Boys, in the story the priest told to me, look what happened. A man went away without confessing his sin. And think of all the things that were done in that incident. The whole situation made an evil. Evil men make the whole situation. And these days similar things occur. Some of you may feel like getting involved when you leave school because you sincerely believe you will be on the cestus fighting for the truth. But boys, let me tell you, there is a judge who sees all, knows all, and is never unjust. There is a law better than the laws of human justice. That law is God's law. And the issue at stake is your immortal soul. That was your grandfather, said McShane to me. I know the story too. He worked at the newspaper office and he was McLaughlin's friend. My father told me all about it. I derided him. I had heard the story too, but I wasn't going to take it on by anyone else. Not if my mother's father was involved. Did Regan know? Was it really my grandfather who had done that? The little man who sat around in his simmet vest all day long, looking sick, scarcely saying a word. January 1959. In that dark winter, two police cars, black and black, that had appeared to have landed like spaceships, 
out of the early morning light of the street. I saw their gleaming metal reflected in the lacquered window glass of the house next door they took off with us. But first there was the search. A bright figure in a white rain cape came through the bedroom door and with his back to the wall, switching the light on and off. They were, I knew, looked gone I had found the afternoon before in the bottom drawer inside the wardrobe of the room next door. Sisters slept. It was a long, chill piss, blue, black and heavy, which I had smuggled out the back to show some from Fawn Street, up near the old city walls. I had learned never even to mention the gun, which I was told had been a gift to my father from German sailor whose submarine had been brought into the port at the end of the war. He had been held with about 30 others in Nissen huts down by the docks, and my father used extra sandwiches or milk every lunchtime when he was helping to wire up the huts for light and heat. Before he went away, the young sailor gave my father the gun the memento. But since we had cousins in jail for being RA, we were a marked family and had to be very careful. Young as I was, I was being stupid. We were gathered round the gun, hefting it, aiming it, Measuring it against our forearms, I had felt eyes watching. Foggy McKeever, known to be a police informer, was at the end of the lane on. He had seen me bring the gun back into the house. I waited ten minutes and then brought it out again, in an old newspaper, and buried it in one of the stone trenches up the field. I was so sure that was enough that I had forgotten about it even before I went to sleep. But now, here were the police, and the house splintered open. We were huddled downstairs and held in the centre of the room when was searched. One policeman opened a tin of Australian peaches and poured the loose scimitar slices and the sugar logged syrup all over the floor. Another went out to the yard and split open a bag of cement in his ransack of the shed. He came walking through in a white cloud, his boots sticking to the slimy line and the cement falling from him in white flakes. But he had sweat or tears on their faces. Then my, father, my elder brother Liam and I were in the police cars and the morning light already reached the rooftops as we turned the corner of the street towards the police barracks, no more than a few hundred yards away. Where was the gun? I had, I had been seen with it. Where was it? Men with huge faces bent down to ask me quietly at first, then more and more loud. They made my father sit at a table and then lean over it with his arms spread. Then they beat him on the neck and shoulders with rubber trunks, short and gorged red in colour. He told them, but they didn't believe him. So they beat us too, leaning across the table from him. When they pushed my chin on the table for a moment, I was looking up at him. Did he wink at me? Or were there tears in his eyes? For long after, I would come awake in the small hours of the morning, sweating, asking my over and over, where's the gun? Where is it? Where's the gun? The police smell took oxygen out of the air and left me lying there with my chest heaving. June 1949. The dismembered streets strewn all around the ruined distillery where Uncle Eddie had fought for the IRA. With the distillery had gone the smell of vaporised whisky and heated wreck, the sullen glow that must have loomed over the crouching houses like sunset. To reach the ruins of the distillery, we only had to cross Blucher Street, go along Eglinton Terrace and across the bog side. There, vast and red-bricked, blackened and gaunt, was the distillery. The black stump roof timbers poked into the sky. I heard that people ran from their houses as the shooting started and the police cordon tightened. The crowd in the street at the top of the bog side started singing rebel songs, but fired over their heads and the crowd scattered. The IRA gunmen, off or at the top floor windows, fired single shots, each one like a match against the sky. They were outgunned, served, lost. It was their last minute protest the founding of the new state. Then the explosion came and the whole building shook and went on fire. No one knew when or if the building would be repaired or knocked down and replaced. It was a burnt space in the heart of the neighbourhood. October 1949. He coughed. Crimson sparks landed all over her grey dress and the bedclothes. She looked at me, her eyes wide. I couldn't move. My legs were so leaden and a pulse panned down from my head to my toes as though someone had slashed me from behind. Before I could reach the door, it opened and Aunt Bernadette came in. 
looked at us and her face went furtive with shock. Sacred, she whispered. Ina. Then Uncle appeared behind her. What is it? Ina was lying back in her bed, her eyes stuck open, her hands scrabbling at the coverlet. She started to gasp again, then coughed sharply. It sounded like a fox barking. This time I moved from the bedside towards the wall, brushing at my shirt. There was a sudden rush of noise as though someone had turned on a radio. Bernadette was crying as she washed her sister's mouth and face, squeezing the face cloth into the reddened water that shone in its white enamel base lower. Fonzie disappeared. Then almost immediately the stairs rumbled with running feet and shouts. A doctor came, his stethoscope dangling, then a priest unscrolling a purple surplice. Go home and tell your father to come down here this minute, quick as he can, they at once, urging me out. I went down the stairs, three at a time, into the street where a stiff wind blew, full of the wild smells of the river and the sickness of the nearby bakery. I took a shortcut through the side street back field. The yard gate was bolted, so I hopped over the wall and jumped clear of the road below. As I landed, my father came out of the shed. Ina's sick. They sent me you. He came close and bent down to me. Look at you, child, he said. Look at you. You've got her blood all over you. His huge hand touched my cheek. My mother came hurrying down the... Look at him, mother. Look at him. That's Ina's blood in his shirt. They said, like that, Christ, she's taken bad again. She must be... And he ran after us into the house to fetch his jacket and was gone. In his funeral, after the grave had been closed, my brother Liam motioned in close behind some of the men who were standing around in knots, talking. Listen and then move away, choking with laughter at their accents and their repetitions. For it wasn't talking, it was more like chanting. And dear, but that's a sore heart this time of the year. We Christmas and top of all. Tis that, a sore heart indeed. Aye, and Christmas too. That guy, so it is, sore surely. They would tug their caps forward with a peak and nod their heads in unison, shuffling their feet. Did you see Bernadette now, the younger sister? Was that a death? She's far changed now. Far changed indeed, but sure she'd be shook bad by that death. Aye, the manner of it. So quick. Still, you can see the likeness to the brother. The dead spit him. Which brother do you mean? The lost one, Eddie. The one that disappeared. I never saw him. Is that who she's like? Isn't it strange now the way families... Liam and I had stopped laughing. We both listened. But they said little before my father appeared. He turned us over to him. Now there's a double sore heart, said one of them, they moved off. The oldest boy gone, God knows where, and now the sister. Never had good health, God help her. So Eddie looked like Bernadette. That was something. But Bernadette, to my eyes, looked like my father. Not from the same day, what do you expect? My mother asked. Had she seen Eddie? As I asked, I wondered that I hadn't thought to ask this option before. Hardly at all, was her short answer. But that did, I persisted. So was he like my father? Very like. Somewhat. She was stalling, so I switched. Tell me, Hugh, had Eddie anything to do with that? Child, you tell me, I think sometimes you're possessed. Can't you just let the past be the past? But it wasn't the past, and she knew. February 1950 silent feud. I dreamed of the farmhouse on Egal, sunlit and wide, pungent and clean, and of the shy shore cattle straying on the sand far below, nimble and the seaweed glittering wet on the shore and drying into mulch on the f- its foul beach odour dried out to a bitterness in the air. My father sang as he washed the dishes and saucepans. Where lag and steam sings lullaby, there goes a lily fair. Twilight gleam is in her eye, the night is on her hair. That was a Donegal song. An old man from Terman used to sing it, and his grandfather heard it way in the days before the famine. It was never lagging, the one that flowed through Belfast, just a stream that ran all over the place where it fed into a tributary of the River Foyle. Did you hear it, I wanted to know? Was Grandfather a song collector? No, the old man who sang it was a road worker. 
One day he gave great grandfather directions to the mountain road that ran towards the poisoned glen, way out in West Donegal door. And great grandfather bought him a pint in a nearby public house. It was there that the old man stood up, took off his cap, and sang. On. This time I sang the second verse to his humming. But like a love sick land and she she has my heart in thrall. No life I own nor liberty. For love is Lord of all. I couldn't reach notes, and all the grace notes had gone a quavering. But he smiled anyway into my hair, then laughed when he realised his hands were still soapy and wet. My hair with a towel. Good song, that one, he said. I nodded and said I would love to go into Donegal more often, to that place where great grother no, great great grandfather had heard it, that place called Terman, or even where grandfather's family lived up there in the hills near the gap of my moor. Some time I would go there, he promised me. Some day me. To the farmhouse, the one with the rafters. I could remember the day we were there. It'd be great to see it again. I knew then he was going to tell me something terrible some day. And sudden fright didn't want him to. Before his died, he told me, they used to sing that and other songs together. He was the sweetest singer. I had known he would be. When his parents became ill, they were taken away immediately to the fever hospital their side, across the file, and he never saw them again, not even at the wake, for the coffins closed. When the funerals were over, he remained back to the house and finding a lot of the furniture gone already. All then and was burnt. The house was fumigated and then closed up and the children were all divided between relatives. That's when his sisters went to live with their mother's sister and her husband in the feud farmhouse in Dunnell. It was then too that Eddie went away without warning. My father never saw him again, although he was told Eddie had enlisted. He couldn't remember how he was told. All he remembered was that the whole world he had known was swept away in a week, and two weeks. He was a child one moment, the next, he was in of a whole distraught family of children. He was only 12 and Eddie, five years older, had gone. He got a job as messenger boy in a hardware store owned and managed by a Protestant, Mr Edmund, who sacked him after he had asked for his first raise in five years. It was after that he started to box for a living. Later still, he got the job he started as a labourer working to an electrician in the naval base. Uncle Fonzie and my father stayed with cousins and he remembered his aunt putting out her hand at stop Fonzie reaching for the butter. You eat margarine, she told him. Butter's for the children of this house only. They left that night, he said, his face reddening slightly even at the memory. Stayed in a hostel and within a week he had rented a room in the Carlisle Road for himself and arranged for Fonzie to go to live with other relatives who promised to treat him as one. And they did. He stayed in a room for four years living on porridge, potatoes and buttermilk, training, starting to box in the ring. The family was sold. The children never saw a pen money. When he visited that farmhouse, he found the place was full of furniture, pictures from his parents' home, and his sisters, Ina and Bernard, sleeping in pallet beds in a shack beside the hen house. That he never even wanted to see those people again. And he never wanted us anything to do with them either. And in the meantime, Eddie was for freedom. He shook his head bitterly at that. Freedom in this place never was, never would be. I looked at his bowed head and his large hands, pink clean from suds. I wanted to ask him about Eddie if he'd tell me, but I'd come to tell me only because I asked. He looked up at me, smiled, say, Ah, well, it was all blood under the bridge and I should bother no more with it. The feud. Did it really start at farmhouse at Cock Hill outside Boncrana? The one with the raftered ceiling walls lined with books? Was it really from the door of that farmhouse that my father swept up my brother and me, followed by my mother, to years of silence? I remember the great rafters as I rose up in his arms and the dusty road out when he put me down, and their voices above us, and the sky above them filling with hammerhead cloud off the Atlantic. We never saw the farmhouse again. My father's mother longed into our house soon afterwards, so my mother told me, and stood at the bed as my father slept, watching him, and smiled at my mother, 
and touched the blankets that covered him and was gone. My mother had a touch of the other about her, so people would say, and she seemed pleased enough with it. Was that a peer signal from my father's mother that she was pleased with him for having rescued her children and brought them out of their bondage? My mother thought so, too. But then I remembered Eddie again. He had not been rescued. But nothing to do with the feud, had he? No. He had left soon as parents died. And when he reappeared, it was only to disappear again. That rosy glow of exploding whiskey. The feud. The word hand you're about it that I savoured although it occurred to me that maybe there was more to be told. But it was only a half sense that warned me what I had been told was not all there was to tell. When my bed and looked at the picture of the sacred heart on the bedroom wall, I thought of his sad eyes as she fell back dying on the bed. Its eyes watched me, whether I moved or lay still. Its mournfulness always gave me the same sensation, that deeper sorrow in the family than I could yet know. The eyes were asking me to acknowledge the sharpness of a grief that could soak the heart.